Hello, and welcome to Story Radio, the podcast for writers, readers, and lovers of short stories everywhere. Today, we're going to be listening to The Death of Brutus, written and read by Mark Tulin. The Death of Brutus by Mark Tulin. Get me ready, we're going out, Betty commanded from the wheelchair. Where, I asked, snapping on my plastic gloves. We're going to get another hamster. Brutus needs company. He's a little down in the dumps, and I think a new brother would cheer him up. Betty didn't see me roll my eyes. All I could think was, here we go again. Don't you think the O'Brien twins are enough company for Brutus, I asked? No, they're females. He needs a male. Betty kept buying hamsters and feeding them food pellets until they ended up bloated and dead at the bottom of a hamster cage. They're hungry, she said, taking one in her gnarled fingers. You're so cute. Yes, you are. You want mommy to give you something yummy? Betty became disabled from a car accident in her mid-thirties, spending the rest of her life in a wheelchair. All the aides have quit working with her for one reason or another. I prefer less obstinate people, but surprisingly, I found her brace of personality a bit charming. I prepared Betty for the trip, wheeling her into the shower and soaping her body, lathering her hair with the dandruff shampoo, scrubbing her back and careful not to miss a spot. It was a long process, but that's not the half of it. Having to lift her and slip on her pants and blouse at the same time was a major challenge not to mention changing her catheter bags. Once at the corner of Carpinteria Street, the bus promptly arrived. It took about 20 minutes to reach Pet's Love, where everyone who worked there knew Betty. Hi, Betty, how are you, dear? said the manager. I'm back for another little furry fella, she said. This one better be good. I wheeled her to the hamster display, which was a glass cage stacked with an assortment of hamsters and a few random chew toys. The manager, who had a hairy mole in his cheek, took extra special care of Betty. Which one would you like, the long hairs or the regulars? Oh, no. I had a long hair once, and he died on me. Give me a short hair, and make sure this one lasts. Betty, said the manager, trying to hide his exasperation. You know that there are no guarantees. If you clean the cage, change the water, and don't ever feed, the hamster, he'll live longer. She nodded her head, but didn't listen. She would go home, clean the cage once a month to save on bedding, and feed him multiple times a day. Then the poor hamster would overeat, and I'd find him on his back, stiff as a rock, with a blurry death glaze. Betty held a chubby one in her hands. He squirmed between her gnarled fingers, then climbed down her floral blouse and onto her lap. Do you need any help? I asked. Don't just stand there, Phil. Get him before he falls. He looked up at me with his sad juju beat eyes. He didn't even wiggle or try to escape. This one is a keeper, I told Betty. She nodded as much as she could, given her disability. And the manager, with the hairy mole in his cheek, put the poor critter into a little cardboard box for us to take home. I attempted to attached the box to the back of the wheelchair, but Betty insisted that she hold him on her lap. Remember what happened to Calvin, she said. He chewed right through the box and he ran away. I remembered all too clearly. We scoured the neighborhood for hours, unable to find him. Lucky for us, the manager of Pet's Love gave us a new one for free. I unfurled Betty's fingers and placed a box between her shaky hands, Her fingers clutched the box like she was holding the family jewels. Every time Betty felt the hamster nibble on the cardboard box, she said lovingly, No, baby, we'll be home soon. You'll have a big brother to play with. Miraculously, the hamster listened, stopped gnawing on the box. Once home, I changed Betty's leaky catheter and took the hamster to the cage. I held the hamster box open for a few seconds not rushing the hamster into his new home, and instead allowing him to sniff around so he could feel safe. 
I watched him slowly venture into the cage, pausing cautiously, then took a few more steps and burrowed completely under the white bedding. As I filled the water bottle, Betty called out from the living room, His name is Caesar! That's it! Caesar! She had just watched Cleopatra on cable and wanted her new hamster to have a powerful Roman name to go along with Brutus. As for Brutus, I didn't see him in the cage. He usually greeted me with a couple of excited squeaks when I opened the door or tapped on his water bottle. I searched under the mound of bedding, and there he was, as stiff as a rock. His eyes were open, and he had a frozen grin like death was a happy occasion. Goodbye, Brutus, I whispered. I hope you do better in your next life. I hope you find happiness wherever you're going. Because wherever you go, I'm sure it will be better in this place. I presented a dead hamster to Betty, who was busy cleaning the wax from her ears with a Q-tip. When she realized that Brutus was dead, she cried like a part of her had died, perhaps conjuring up thoughts of her body mangled in that unfortunate crash. No, Brutus, you can't be dead, she repeated, then looked at me with her roomy eyes. I bought him a few months ago. He was alive this morning. If I reprimanded her for feeding him too much, she'd give me much grief, so I just stared at Brutus lying like a rock on the table with shards of white bedding stuck to his greasy fur. Betty was a dreamer, a believer in miracles. She believed that one day God would come down from the heavens and make her walk again. She often invited her priest to sprinkle her with holy water, which gave her some hope that her struggles would one day be over and her body healed. We're going to save him, she said. Brutus will rise from the dead will invoke the heavenly spirit. I felt like saying, the only special powers that you have, Betty, is being a royal pain in the ass. But Betty put her crooked finger on the dead hamster's head and grabbed my hand. With the power of God invested in me, I command the life in your body to resurrect and become whole again. A few minutes of awkward silence followed. The clouds didn't open up, nor did a bolt of lightning strike Brutus, reviving his limp body that would awaken a hamster version of Frankenstein. Please, Lord, she said, with her eyelids closed tight. Bring to life our Brutus. Make him breathe again. Make his tiny legs spin on his brass wheel once more. She kept thumping the poor guy's forehead with her fingertips, as the faith healers do on television. After 20 minutes of failing to revive Brutus, Betty thankfully gave up. We have to bury him, she said, craning her neck to look up. Bring in Caesar and the O'Brien twins, she ordered. Brutus would have wanted them at his funeral. Are you sure you want Caesar to participate? He's had a long day, and I'm sure he's still adjusting to his new cage. Nonsense, snapped Betty. He's a hardy fellow. I'm sure he wants to be with us in our time of sorrow. I put Caesar in a plastic ball while the O'Brien twins shared another. Then I dug a hole in the yard where the 16 or so other hamsters lay buried. Since Brutus was a highly religious rodent, according to Betty, I got two small twigs and bound them together to make a cross. I placed his rigid body into an eyeglass box and put the little casket into the damp ground. I covered it with dirt and stuck the homemade cross at the head of the tiny gravesite. Betty cleared her throat and spat into her napkin. As a drizzle fell in the backyard, she began her eulogy. We are gathered here today for a very special occasion. Brutus, the late son of Betty Crocker, was taken from us for who knows why. Our family, my health aide Phil, the O'Brien twins, and our newly purchased Caesar are all grief-stricken beyond words. Let us now pray that Brutus finds a place by our Creator's throne. I flicked my lighter in the air to commemorate the solemn occasion. Betty pointed her crooked finger at me, indicating that it was my turn to speak. I cleared my throat. <clears throat> I've known Brutus for the past six months, and in all that time, he's never once bitten or scratched me. 
He had always been appreciative of the food and water that he received, never complained once. More, shouted Betty. As the rain fell harder, I continued, making it up as I went along. Brutus wrinkled his nose and fluttered his whiskers as after he drank water. I place him in the plastic bowl when I clean his cage and watched him roll around the house, knocking into walls and furniture, often getting lodged into the corner of the room, squealing to let me know when he needed help. We always enjoyed when I sang him the Beatles song, Obla di, Obla da. Just then, I heard some squealing coming from the ground. Could it be? I put my ear to the ground and listened closer. The squeals grew louder. I quickly scooped the basket with my hands from the ground and opened it. To my astonishment, Brutus had his eyes open and flinching his whiskers, happy to see me. Betty's eyes teared as she held young Caesar in her hands. Amen, she said loudly, crossed herself, and let out a long, pronounced sigh to the heavens. I put the revived Brutus in Betty's gnarled hands and she began kissing him all over his body, saying how much she missed him and that the power of God really does exist. There was a few minutes of joyful and excessive cuddling. Then the rains came down harder and we all went inside. What do you want to eat, Betty asked. This resurrection business makes me hungry, I smiled. I knew what meal she loves when she's celebrating. I microwaved a Swanson Salisbury steak with mashed potatoes and gravy and returned the O'Brien twins to their cage. There was just a joy and happiness in Betty's eyes for the rest of that day. No complaints about her back or her pain in her arms and legs. She was proud of herself for performing a miracle and rescuing Brutus from the jaws of death. Her life now complete and justified. She let Caesar and Brutus walk on the dining room table as she ate her TV dinner, feeding both with her gnarled fingers some of her peach cobbler. You're the cutest little brothers I ever saw, she said lovingly. The Death of Brutus, written and read by Mark Tulin and produced by Tabitha Potts. If you're enjoying the podcast, why not consider supporting us on Patreon? You can find us online at www.patreon.com forward slash story radio. We'll be back in the new year with more short stories for you to listen to. Till then, stay safe and well. Goodbye.